Coming up on Tech News Today, new Chromebooks. Not, stop laughing. They're actually a lot better than you might think. We're going to talk about them. Also, Microsoft earnings, not so good, but not so bad. Could be actually good news for Microsoft that they had bad earnings. We'll explain that conundrum. Also, Sarah Lane gets mad at feed, and so do the rest of us. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, October 19th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford, featuring available sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day called The News Fuse. Oh, poor little twit logo. Uh, missed your chance to pre-order a Microsoft Surface tablet and get it quickly, at least? Uh, head down to your local Microsoft store. A user... Uh, customer? Uh, poster? <laughs> anyway, somebody at WP Central's forum picked up a reservation pass at a Microsoft store in Oregon. As long as the pass holder gets to the Microsoft store by 12 o'clock noon on October 26th, that holder will have the Surface on day one. The iPhone hacker known as Comex, real name Nicholas Allegra, who's been working for Apple for about a year, stated via Twitter that he's no longer associated with the company because he forgot to reply to an email. Apple had sent him a letter to continue his employment as a remote inter intern, he told Forbes, but then rescinded the offer after not hearing back. Apple initially hired Allegra because of his iPhone jailbreaking skills. Could this mean jailbroken iOS 6? No. Probably not. No, maybe not. Too. He says it's not something he's working on actively right now. Let's talk about the newest Apple project. No, not the mythical iPad mini. Anyone want to guess? Wanna Data guess? center? Yeah. Data center. Apple has begun construction on its $68 million data center in Oregon. Thanks, Tom. Local news sources say that Apple's cleared and flattened the land for the new 338,000 square foot data center. Google's stock took a hit yesterday after its earnings report was published earlier with a paragraph that read, Pending Larry Quote. Uh, Google Corporate Communications Chief Jill Hazelbaker told Time that financial printer R.R. Donnelly filed the draft earnings statement without authorization. Google then requested their stock trading be halted. Guess what? I think RR Donnelly's probably fired. <laughs> Bad day for RR. Microsoft reported its Q1 earnings, and for the three-month period, the firm had revenues of $16.1 billion and earnings per share of $0.53. Cents which is actually bad because analysts had expected revenue at $16.42 billion and earnings per share of $0.56. Cents. The company's stock lost about 1%, then it stabilized. It was kind of a weird day for tech stocks yesterday in general. Windows revenue was actually the weakest. The Windows and Windows Live division posted revenue of $3.4 billion, which is a 33% decrease from the prior year period. Then again, we've got Windows 8 right around the corner, so this is not exactly surprising. Stop the presses, stop the news fuse even, because the Wall Street Journal headline screams, SoftBank CEO won't rule out Metro PCS bid. Well, SoftBank is currently in the process of acquiring Sprint. When you read the article, though, you'll find the CEO was interviewed by the journal and said, quote, we shouldn't rule out any opportunity or alternative. From the article, it doesn't look like anyone, neither the interviewer nor the CEO, used the word Metro PCS, so I guess the headline is technically accurate. Yeah, didn't rule out. Didn't rule Anything, it out. Thing, really. You could buy the world. <laughs> it's true. Has it ruled out purchasing Earth? Security researchers generally recommend that any user, a uh, uh, computer operator? I don't know. Anyone uh, who doesn't need Java should uninstall it. Apple's trying to help with that. An update released Wednesday for OS X removes the Java plugin from all Mac-compatible web browsers, according to Ars Technica. Browsers who come across the need for Java to view content will see a placeholder prompting them to install a missing plugin. They'll need to get the Oracle Java runtime to make it work. 
Sony's cutting about 20% of the firm's headcount, around 2,000 jobs, at its Tokyo headquarters by the end of the fiscal year, which is April 2013. The headquarters are Sony's Minokamo factory, which produces camera and phone, mobile phone lenses and all also offers customer services for the firm's Sony Mobile division that will also see cuts 840 positions to be exact, at least so far. Sony says this will kickstart its revival plan by cutting 10,000 workers, jobs, across its global businesses. They're actually cutting them physically, including approximately 3,000 in Japan. I will cut you. I will cut you. Jobs. You're just your job. Uh, do you want to try your out Firefox's safe. new app marketplace, anybody? Huh? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. sure. Just I'm need Android. Mozilla oh, opened up its Firefox Marketplace for testing to those using the Aurora browser on Android. Have you ever used that one? No, nope, I haven't, actually. I'll have to download it. All the apps are free for now, but Mozilla says a payment system will be implemented in the future so that developers could sell apps as well. Time to pour out a little because 4K is now dead. Or at what? least the, the term I'm gonna is I'm going to pour out a little right into my mouth. That's how uh -oh. coffee. Enjoy that coffee. It's a little early for the bourbon. The Consumer <laughs> Electronics Association said that 4K will be commercially known as Ultra high definition. Da, da, da. With, with including the, <laughs> the fanfare. UHD displays will require a resolution of 3840 by 2160. That's about 8.3 megapixels. So that'll be cool. Megapixels. Hey, this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ford and Ford Sync. You love Ford Sync. You know Ford Sync. You wish that you had Ford you Sync Ford with you Sync's right now. Babies. And you could if you actually went and test drove a Ford right now. Ford Sync is versatile. Browse your music collection by genre, album, artist, playlist, or song title, all using voice commands. Uh, Sync allows voice-activated control of your media player. It'll even play a list of music if you're in the mood for it just by saying, play similar music. When it's playing a song that you like. Don't say it when it's playing a song you don't like. That'll, that'll mess you up. Uh, you can listen to your entertainment off most any device. If your smartphone has Bluetooth and what smartphone doesn't have a Bluetooth, you can Bluetooth stream. USB drive, you just plug it in. MP3 player. And iTunes tagging. If you don't know what iTunes tagging is, it's pretty, pretty cool. You're listening to a song. You say iTunes tag it. You just say it because it's sync. And then it will tag that song. And let you buy it and transfer it into your iPad later from the iTunes store. Best of all, Ford offers sync on every 2012 and 2013 Ford vehicles sold in the United States of America, including the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. All right, uh, Darren Kitchen, uh, unavailable. He's on a train speeding towards San Diego right now because he's going to TourCon. Oh, that's real. It's not like a mask problem set up. Uh, if, <laughs> if one Darren Kitchen is speeding through San Diego at 120 miles an hour and another Darren Kitchen is not here at Tech News Today, what who happens? do we have to discuss this next story with? Um, us. That's right. Microsoft. <laughs> How will we do it? <laughs> with Jason Howell. Let's do our best. That's the thing with story problems is they always sound really complicated, but the answers are really simple. Mm -hmm. Microsoft uh, announced revenues of $16 billion, earnings per share $0.53. Cents. It was below what analysts expected. So stock took a little hit, but it really didn't take that much of a hit uh, because the market said, well, that wasn't great, but we understand Windows 8's coming at the end of this month. Uh, this is, by the way, the Q1 numbers for Microsoft. They have a fiscal year that starts uh, in the middle of the real year. Let's break it down a little, though. Windows and the Windows Live division posted revenue of $3.24 billion. That's a 33% decrease from the prior year period uh, because they deferred a lot of the Windows revenue. In fact, $1.36 billion of that revenue was, was deferred due to the Windows upgrade offer and pre-sales of Windows 8 to OEMs. So they're saying any of that Windows 8 sale, we're, gonna, we're not going to count that yet until the next quarter. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you if you adjust for that, the Windows Live division still had a decline, but it was only 9%. Well, that means they're going to have a giant next quarter in theory because if they're That's deferring they all hope. this, they're yeah. hoping that between the sales that they've done now and the sales that are going to happen with Windows 8, the launch in this fourth quarter, they should see something huge because it seems like the entire PC industry is just waiting. The third quarter for the PC industry, Intel, Microsoft, everybody's just kind of like... Can somebody please make something successful now? What is the point of deferring that revenue if, if, if by not deferring, there's so much less of a decrease and Windows 8 supposedly is going to sell well anyway? Why make the, I mean, the next quarter in theory should be awesome, right? Right, right. But why not have this quarter not be terrible and then the next quarter be just still awesome, but maybe not as high? I would like a financial analyst to actually intelligently answer that mm -hmm. question. But my uh, totally uninformed guess is that they want to be able to account for Windows 8 numbers all in one. 
So to say, like, this quarter we sold this many Windows 8 since launch. This is where the yeah. revenues for Windows 8 start. I suspect there also may be an accounting reason that you need to defer something that hasn't actually sold yet. So you've received the revenue on Windows 8, but Windows 8 can't be sold by the partner, and so you can't. maybe you can't count it to the next quarter. And that's where my knowledge of, of analytics in the financial industry totally peters out. But I know I've seen similar things. Remember when uh, Apple was claiming, oh, we have to charge you for the, for the OS update on iPod Touch mm -hmm. because of accounting reasons? There's weird stuff like that that gets interpreted certain ways that, that may I, i'm i'm dancing here to see oh gardner in the chat room says ace to tech has the right idea so yeah if somebody uh wants it's called unearned income says richard yeah thank you uh if somebody wants to send us a, an explanation tnt at twit.tv definitely appreciate that also uh some other numbers from the earnings online services division managed to grow nine percent during the quarter that's bing that's their ads that they sell into bing and the ads that they're they're uh Working with Yahoo, uh, they get a little bit out of that partnership as well. Now, that division still lost money. So it's not like Bing is making them money yet, but at least it's not losing money as quickly as it Oh, as they'll it was. just add something into their social search bar, and it'll be better than ever. And my contention is that Microsoft really should lean into enterprise more and become an IBM and that was borne out a little bit this quarter. Server and tools business reported $4.55 billion in the first quarter. Revenue increase of 8% from the prior year period. And that was larger revenue than Windows for the first time in Microsoft's corporate history. Well, I mean, that, that doesn't, I, I mean, this has to happen at some point. Because, again, Windows, we're, everyone is waiting for Windows 8. So they're, they have so, so much inertia in the enterprise at this point that I would assume that they're consistently doing well because... What's the alternative in the enterprise? Do you want to use? You can use Linux, and it's free. But it does and a require, lot of people do, yeah. And, and there does, there is, there are paid options where there's actually some support there too. But Microsoft's just been in the in the business world for so long. On the desktop, though, on the server side, Linux is is really eaten away at them. Uh, you know, and 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 not that they're sitting there and and not doing anything about it, but th that is an area where they could really really beef up and, and win and it looks like they are they're selling servers yeah, i'm just I'm, that just got me thinking how microsoft their products and the enterprise has become more compatible with a lot more uh, operating systems including linux at this point when it comes to interacting with them so yeah. that would pro that probably help them a lot because i know we talked about this on, on windows weekly mary joe foley is an expert on this this kind of uh, enterprise side but microsoft's done a lot of uh, steps to become much more compatible with every other thing that it's no longer a, you're not shutting yourself out of options when you go with Microsoft and the enterprise. I guess what, you know, that's a really good point. And what we should say is don't just look at Microsoft's sales of Windows and Xbox and Bing as the success of Microsoft. They've, they've got a whole enterprise business that doesn't get covered on this show because we cover consumer electronics more than anything uh, that is keeping them strong as well. And, and speaking of Xbox, Xbox uh, numbers People declined. People electronics, I think you mean. People, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Breathing Human. with hearts. Electronics made of humans. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Xbox by humans for humans. Declined by 1%. <laughs> the Office division declined by 2%. Office division declined also because they deferred some of the revenue of, of Office installations for the next version that have been uh, sold as well. Xbox declined, uh, even though it's still leading the consoles, because consoles are in that down period. They're, we're near the end of a cycle. I expect those Xbox numbers to tick back up in the holiday season when people start buying gifts for each other. Uh, and then next year, they're going to have to come out with a new console or else... You know, they're in trouble, but I'm, I'm not too worried about that number for Microsoft. Let's talk about 4K TV. I'm really looking for, forward to this next version of HDTV 4K, right? You, you are? Okay, yeah, well, 4K. Look, all right, 4K. It's called 4K, right? Not anymore. No, 4K what? is dead. Why? Because consumer 4K is dead already? It hasn't even been, like, released practically. Well, it's not going to be the name you'll see on the box, right? It'll still have a, a, a number involved with it. So the Consumer Electronics We're calling it User. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna rebrand it as since nobody's using user anymore. We can just the U stands I really for hope it. everybody listened to yesterday's show, or this right. is all gonna seem very strange. <laughs> yeah, so go back. We have like a footnote. Go just and look listen, up Jack Dorsey. If this doesn't user, make sense. You'll listen find to yesterday. All right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, what was I talking let's about? Let's get back to uh, they're rebranding 4K. Right, right, right. Consumer Electronics Association saying that 4K is gonna be called ultra high definition. You'll see it on the boxes. Like I said before, 3840 by 2160. Uh, that's a pretty big display. That's at the minimum for UHD, which makes it sound like there could be 
Ultra High Def could include other oh, resolutions. No, it's the new 4G. Possibly. Different kinds possibly. of 4G. Oh, I hope now, not. <laughs> now, now, there's also other requirements for the display to be called ultra high def. It's going to have to have at least one 4K capable digital input, has to be able to display 4K content without upconverting, and it's, gonna, it's supposed to be really big at next year's CES. This is a quote from the uh, CEO of CEA, Gary Shapiro. This new terminology and the recommended attributes will help consumers navigate the marketplace to find the TV that best meets their needs. All right. I, I want to ask a question because are consumers, users, or whatever you want to call them, too dumb to understand a resolution on a screen, like 1920 by 1080? Do we have to have 4K, ultra high def, or any of these things? Or can we just have the, the numbers up? Do you want to ask Gary Shapiro? I, I would love I a, to ask Gary Shapiro. There's, there's a picture of him right there. Look, he actually wrote presciently, right? There says, Tom, 4K is not the future. We will call it high. <laughs> What's going on here Why today? can't consumers get the numbers? I, What's wrong with numbers? They're not, they're not hiding the numbers from consumers. They're just saying 4K doesn't mean a whole lot. People understand what HD TVs are. So Ultra HD TV is a HD TV that is a better resolution, and here's the resolution specifically. It's going to be on the box when you buy the product. I'm, I'm with I'm with Sarah. If 4K had never had any name out there at all, and I'm I'm an HD TV user, and I go to the store and I see Ultra HD TV, I assume okay. HD TV that's to, better. I need to make sure this is true, but it sounds like that's the brand that is the next step up. Thing is, I feel like 4K has got some awareness out there. Maybe not with everybody. But we're, I'm worried that we're headed towards a 4G situation yeah. here where, where they, they bankrupt a term. 4K, we all know what it means. It's got a specific meaning. And it's starting to be branded like, oh, if you go to the theater, you can see this one projected in 4K. It's got some cachet. It sounds cool. And granted, it's not as obvious to as the successor to HDTV, but 4K TV, I, I think people would get it. Somebody in the chat room saying, I don't understand marketing. No, I get marketing. I'm just irritated with this because I just think that it lets you use things like 32-inch class television. When you start giving these mm. this term that has at least in there, you can either up the res or lower the res. And like one of the things that happens high def is that the... the you can't lower it. It's at least. Well, I'm just saying, mm. we, we'll see. It's like the ultra bucks it, of well, TVs. Kind of, yes. I guess ultra yeah. is the future. But the, <laughs> but the thing is, like, like when HD came out, right? They were supposed to be 1280 by 720 and then uh, 1980 by uh, 1920 by 1080 as well. Now, because the electronics manufacturers did not like the idea of being under one megapixel, they moved it up to 1366 by 768. That's why we had that stupid display that doesn't that you have to upscale to fit what's going on there. I don't care for this kind of mm. let's do the at least. Just call this 4K. And we know that means 4,000 pixels horizontally. Leave that alone. So when 8K comes out, that's not called UHD because it probably will be because it's at least it's no, ultra. but it won't. But it won't. See, I think I think you're building up a straw man here, uh, okay, unintentionally. Because what happens straw when somebody comes people. out with an 8K TV, uh, they don't say, oh, "Well, let's call it the old name." It's the, that'd be like saying if somebody came out with a 4K TV, they'll say, "Well, I can call it HD TV because it has to be at least 1080p, and this is better." Nobody wants that because that sounds old. That sounds behind. You want the new name. It, when you come out with the better TV. And so I, I don't think you run into that problem. Well, that's assuming that, that manufacturers don't come out with 8K and 4K televisions at the same time. Like I they would, did with the I two think, versions of HD. Honestly, I think what we're more in danger of is 8K leapfrogging 4K. How and, so? And, and, and because NHK uh, and, uh, and the BBC were out there during the Olympics promoting 8K as... Hey, let's go right to this. Why does that scare you? Isn't that well, just does, a good thing? I shouldn't have. That was poorly phrased. It <laughs> frightens ah! me. Ah. Uh, it, it keeps what, you up uh, at night, what, doesn't it, Tom? I do. I can't sleep. Hey, I, just, I mean, coming. better resolution but is I, better I, for I us. I wonder if, if 4K, if all of this is meaningless, is mm -hmm. basically what I'm saying. Yeah. And they're, we, they're and we just jump 4K right to 8K. Just, well, I wanted to say that. So, well, then, so then the obvious... Ken from Chicago pointed out 4K, you say it too fast, you get yourself in trouble. Yeah, you would get yourself in trouble. The obvious question here is, what's better than Ultra? Because if 8K is going to have a different name, Uber, Uber, Mega, Mega, Mega HD, I don't know. Infinity Plus One <laughs> HD. Have, but, the, but whatever oh, word they infinity. choose That's has happen, to be, isn't it? whatever <laughs> cho word they choose has to be obviously better than Ultra. So infinity. maybe this is where they get into the Android naming infinity? scheme where they're like Ultra Plus HD. No, I think yeah. you guys, it's Infinity. You guys right. nailed it. 
Uh, Infinity. Well, now you know. Ultra what? HD, 4K, they're the same thing, pretty much. Let's get ranty about feed. Oh, my goodness. You're talking about feed with a pH. I am. Yeah, like, like fat. Like fat. Yeah. yeah, so Forbes wrote an article this morning that I swear before I even went to the service, which is called feed, you can go there at feed.com, I read it and it almost read like an advertisement. It was a very strange article where I'm like, this is, okay, all right, this sounds like a really great service. Turns out that it's supposed to be a Twitter alternative, and in fact, in many ways, works very much like Twitter, with a few differences. One of the differences is that instead of 140 characters, you get 420 characters. Oh, isn't that sweet? I love 420 jokes. They're well, awesome. Well, I get it, because of the pot yeah, thing with the 420. Yeah, it's a pot reference, or maybe it isn't, but I'm no, going to go out on a limb and not shoot myself in the foot, because then I would fall out of the tree. <laughs> Um, and say that it's supposed to be a winky winky pot reference, which is kind of dumb. Also, as a user of feed, once I've signed up and I got my username easily, there wasn't another Sarah Lane that beat me to the punch, I can choose to uh, share whatever with Tom and Ayaz and Jason for free, or I can say if they want to read my updates, which include text, uh, text posts, audio updates, video stuff, or I can choose to uh, um, start a live broadcast at any time. I could choose to charge you $1.99 or $5.99 or $39.99 because I can set the price. It's a reverse app.net for, for celebrities. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about it is that I can set my price. I can make it whatever I want as long as somebody pays for it. I guess it's worth my while. But feed takes half of that. They say it's to help them, you know, keep their servers running and they get profits too and they provide the infrastructure and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you mentioned celebrities. There are quite a few celebrities that are supposedly using feed. It's the hot new celebrity platform like Paris Hilton and Slash. Miley Cyrus. And yeah, David Greta, who I like, but then I went to his feed and it turns out, oh no, he just has a splashy page that his social media manager put together. He hasn't actually posted anything, but when he does, it's not going to be free. Drummer Boy Fresh, Machine Gun Kelly, they're all featured right now. So if this doesn't sound super compelling, I will make it even less compelling because I decided, okay, well, I'll go ahead and, and sign up for an account. I noticed that Ayaz had also signed up this morning, so I'm like, okay, I'll have one friend on feed to start with. I don't want to follow any celebrities. So I just posted posted, hmm, I think uh, I, I posted just why, just you know, why. like in, in reference to like, why do I need this service? Well, because I had signed in via my Twitter credentials, which was actually, I have to say, a very strange unrendered page. There was some something wrong with the page where uh, it wasn't displaying properly this morning. So I was like, I think this is my Twitter credentials, you know, which brings over my Twitter profile picture and blah, blah, blah. It decided to auto post to Twitter. Oh. Hey, I've just signed up for feed. Check it out. Like this really lame, stupid, generic. Oh, you mean crappy... like that? That. I just that. opened my feed. Just like that. Check it out. Fammed. Yeah. I went ahead. But and... I had it open so that I could do this right away. Nope. Yeah. Delete. <laughs> I, del I deleted mine as well, but not before. I mean, I got a bunch of responses from on Twitter of people saying, you know, anything from, ooh, it looks like it auto posted to people saying, oh, cool. Thanks, Sarah. I will check it out. That was not me. That was not my wording. Yeah, that was not my anything. Choice. They didn't give you a chance to edit it. Nope. It just goes. They, yep. didn't, See, they, they didn't give me a chance to edit it, but they didn't give me a chance to say, don't do that. Yeah. Right. There, but so, for the grace of Ayaz goes I, because I was sitting here about to sign up and Ayaz is like, oh, don't use Twitter to sign in. It'll auto post. And I, I'm looking to see, like, okay, where do I turn that off? Because I would like the convenience. There was nowhere to turn it off. There was no indication it was going to auto post. Yes. And so somebody on Twitter it. had responded to me, no, you, you just sign up using your email, and then this doesn't happen to you, which is totally still not good enough. I can't have they didn't a service warn you that. where I have to really think about how they're not going to screw me over on another network and become some spammy service that I didn't ask for by outsmarting them. Unacceptable. Uh, there was actually a, a lot of other people who feel the same way as me. A lot of folks this morning were like, what? What did you do that for? Feed, you suck. I hate you. Um, uh, somebody posted uh, an article on Media Bistro's uh, Twitter blog called All Twitter. Um, and, and she said, all Twitter has to do is add a button to our profile settings that lets us permanently opt out of auto posting from third party services. That is something that Twitter could do. They could just yep. allow us to block that a blanket block, which I absolutely agree or put is it in essential. A, a draft bin so that we can approve it. You just know. something. Yeah. Let me uh, 
edit my options on the Twitter side so I don't have to think about this every time, even Facebook. And Facebook uh, apps, when you when you connect third-party apps to Facebook, that can be spammy too, but at least Facebook gives you options to selectively say, I want the app to do this, but not that. With Twitter, it's, do you want to connect to your Twitter account? Do you want to connect? It's like a blanket uh, relationship handshake. I can say no, and then it's like, okay, well, then you can't sign in with Twitter. So all in all, you like it. I, th I hope that that came through. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a great new service. No, and also I auto-followed the feed team by... Uh, oh, no, that's just in there. That's yeah. just... You know, I can decide to that's unfollow like them. That's like friends with Tom. That, on MySpace, yeah. yeah. It's called the Feed House, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's like you look through that feed and they're promoting artists that they want me to follow that are not free. And it's like, what a load of crud. I hate it. Yeah. I hate everything about you, Feed. I I'm going to talk about the positive stuff about okay. Feed. Because uh, I, right. there, there's Finally. some in there. Uh, I, I quite like the the options. That I think some of the stuff should be in Twitter. I mean, there's there's text, audio, photos, videos. You can broadcast from here. The idea that I, I see. I mean, they're obviously catering to uh, people who are going to get paid for their content because the broadcast things are pay per view systems. So if you are if you are like a content producer, like if you're like a Louis C.K. or something, and you wanted to do this live, it looks like it's really easy to set up as opposed to going through something like Livestream.com or trying to set up something with uh, with YouTube proper and that kind of thing. To have a channel to do this kind of thing. Uh, from a, it kind of democratizes that a little bit. Apart from that, all the spamming stuff that kind of all sucks. But I mean, it it just seems like it, these are functions that Twitter eventually will rip off because these are pretty good functions. Except there's a lot of things in the execution that annoy everybody off the top. So. I think there's some positive. I, you know, I, I go back and forth on whether I think this is going to catch on or not. There's so many of these these sorts of things launching all the time. Uh, this one has some celebrity interest and celebrity backing, so they may capture a certain audience that is really into the folks who are using it, uh, and and so it may catch on a little better. The fact that they give celebrities a chance to charge their audience, though, I think that's going to turn a lot of people away. All the criticisms that, that were raised about app.net charging you to use it kind of apply in reverse here. Uh, I'm, I'm not willing to say that this is a slam dunk failure, but I think the odds are against it. I also feel like with all the, take the live broadcasting part of it, which is, I have no problem with the idea of live broadcasting. And yes, if you're a huge Miley Cyrus fan, for example, and I use her as an example because she's one of the users of, of Feed, then sure, you might want to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff. But there are so many free services that she could use. You know, you could have a live hangout on Google+. Plus. You could use Ustream. There's, I mean, the, the list goes on. And you figure that for a lot of celebrities, these are promotional tools. You're promoting something else, right? That's why you're participating in something where you want a lot of people to join you. It's the nickel and diming aspect of it. Unless you're truly going to sing a song I will never hear anywhere else, and that's very exciting to me, is sort of insulting. Mm. Yeah, well, and you have to have an audience to make money off something like this, so that it's all about whether they can get people to switch to them, which is uh, easier said than done. I'll take a quick break and give you some cash. Thanks to our sponsor, Gazelle.com. It's the place to go if you want the simplest way to get rid of your old iPhone, your old iPad, your Android phone, your MacBook. Uh, you want that new gadget. Before you get the new one, make sure you sell your old one. And if you're like, oh, but I don't want to sell my old one because I haven't got the new one yet, that's the brilliance of Gazelle. 30-day lock-in. You go in right now. Just do it because it's risk-free, okay? If you're saying, well, I'm not sure I want to sell it, go do it anyway. Go and tell them what your gadget is. Find out how much it's worth. If you look at that number and say, hey, wait a minute, that's a couple hundred dollars I could use, you've got 30 days to decide if you want to sell them that gadget. Then then if you do decide you want to sell it, you send them to them for free. They, they pay for the shipping, and you get paid fast by PayPal or by check. You get that cash, and then you can go... Uh, and use that cash to upgrade. Or you, if you've already upgraded, put it in the bank account and use it for whatever you want. It's cash money. You can spend it anywhere. Legal tender is accepted. Try it out. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. That's gazelle.com. Lock in your quote now because gadgets probably aren't going to get more valuable over time. Uh, and it's risk-free. Do it today. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News today. Do we have more Tech News to talk about why? We do today. Why, yes. Uh, in fact, we do. 
I want to talk about the Samsung Chromebook. We we mentioned it yesterday because the announcement came out right after the leaked SEC mm -hmm. filing, and I jokingly said Google is using it to distract people. Uh, but it's cheap, two hundred forty nine dollars. And now there's a, a new version that was announced since yesterday. Yeah, there's a second model. So there's two models. Uh, let's talk about the Chromebooks. These are super thin, 11.6-inch screen, 16 gigabytes of storage, 2 gigabytes of RAM, Bluetooth, and everything you, sh you should have on a laptop. But these Chromebooks are running on uh, Exynos 5 dual processors. These are ARM-based. That's why they're so cheap. $250 uh, for, for the Wi-Fi-only model and a $330 model with 3G. Now, that was announced, I believe, sometime last night or in the morning today. Uh, the 3G Chromebook comes with two years of up to 100 megabytes of free data per month from Verizon. So these are incredibly low-cost machines running the latest version of Chrome. I believe that this, this version of Chrome actually has Google Now on top of it. So you have all of these functions built in. It's effectively, it's a, it's a phone that's just completely in a laptop. It seems like to me, like I, I just wanted to buy a whole bunch to keep around my house because this is this is really cheap, two hundred fifty dollars. And according to Engadget, the trackpad's pretty good. This is usually the big problem with with not just Chromebooks, but with any notebook. People complain about trackpads. I do it all the time. Apparently, this one's not bad. Uh, I'm just kind of curious about your opinions about this two hundred and fifty dollar laptop. Half the price of an iPad. And it's and it's Chrome OS. Their their new version, which actually has that windowed experience. If you're not familiar with that. It's a compelling price point. Uh, you, all, all of the objections to the Chromebook are usually uh, the limitations on it, uh, you know, the, the lack of software for it, uh, you know, particular software that people like, you know, Microsoft Office, stuff like that. Uh, but if you just need something for email and for, for web browsing and, and a few apps, if you live in Google Docs, if you live in the cloud, this, this becomes more and more practical. Uh, it's not perfect. But then for $249, you could buy it as a as an interim laptop. I mean, that's what I'm using this Linux laptop for is so I don't have to haul the MacBook Pro around anymore, right? It's an interim laptop. Just How much did that moving. laptop run you? $899. So two, <laughs> 250 sounds pretty good. I mean, and this is a much more powerful sure, laptop sure. than that. Well, but it's got a different operating system, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, 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 but this that, is something that you used uh, in conjunction with other computers. Exactly. Because it made sense for you, which the Chromebook would also make sense for people in a lot of situations. Sir, do you think this is something that, like, I, I was thinking about a MacBook Air, Retina display, hopefully one day, but this is 250 bucks. It's got a, it's got 1366 by 768 display, so it's not super, you know, high res or anything. But, again, $250, I think this makes it really easy to forgive a lot of the shortcomings. It's a little plasticky that people are complaining, but... Well, that's, exa that's exactly what it is, right? It looks like a MacBook Air when I see the photos. It's probably not going to feel too much like a MacBook Air. Obviously, the resolution is not as nice. The trackpad, I hope it's great. But if there's any problems at all, people will zero in on that. The plasticky nature of it. I mean, that's all stuff that you either say, yeah, I'm totally willing to look past that because this is cheap, this is affordable, it does the stuff I want to do. Or you say, no, I want to save up for the MacBook Air with the Retina display because it's what I consider the best of the best in that category. Did you mention the free 3G? Yes. Because I think that's compelling the, as well. You know, if you buy the $330 model, you get uh, 3G for up to two years, 100 megabytes a month for free, by the way. So this comes with it. When you buy it, you yeah. have this device. 100 megabytes isn't a lot, but it's free. Yeah. So you're talking about like, okay, I want to check Twitter right now on the go. You can do that. You don't need a hotspot there. And it's Verizon's network, because I believe, I don't think they were on Verizon before the other Chromebooks, but that's a real big difference. And this, this, this is supposed to last six and a half hours on its battery. And there's an extra bit on this. You get 100 gigabytes on Google Drive when you get the Chromebook. So instead of having five, you get 100. So you have all this cloud storage, which makes a lot of sense for the mm -hmm. Chrome OS, because it doesn't. it's got 16 gigabytes of onboard storage. But it just seems like... 250 for a computer. That's just dirt cheap. I just want to, I just, they're, they're available Monday, by the way. So I'd like to go get one. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I'm tempted too at that price, but I got to, everything's coming out right now. You know, if I bought every single thing, like, oh, I want a Microsoft Surface. Ooh, I, I want the new Chromebook. Ooh, I, I'll get an iPad mini. I, I'm going to go broke. I got to be careful. <laughs> uh, Larry Page uses a Chromebook. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We're going to talk about the Google earnings call. But first, Sarah has another new startup to talk about. <laughs> How do you feel about airtime? Not very good, uh -oh. Tom. Here we go. Oh, you thought I was done? I'm actually going to be nicer to airtime because I don't really have a problem with airtime specifically. We talked about it the, the, the day it launched, and that is the only time I've ever used it because I don't find it to be a compelling service. This, of course, 
is a video chatting service where I could connect to IAS. The idea is that because we would share interests and likes and maybe similar type of music and be in the same industries, we would get matched up together. It's not just about uh, video sharing with your friends. In fact, that's you not sign the in point. Via Facebook, right? Like this, that's how it ties. Exactly. Into yeah. So the first time I signed in, I, you know, there was a there was a guy on the other side of the screen, and we had some friends in common, and you know, we tweeted at each other, and it was a fun five minutes. Whatever. It wasn't creepy at all. Of course, a lot of people might remember that airtime sort of spun out of the idea of a chat roulette that wasn't just about people being lewd. Yes. Uh, and well totally phrased. anonymous. It was actually about putting people in front of you, uh, not physically, but but via video, that you actually are going to probably want to have a conversation with. Started by Sean Parker and Sean Fanning, obviously of Napster fame. Sean Parker has also uh, famously been involved with Facebook and, and, uh, and what's the music service? That Napster? No, not Napster. MySpace? Spotify, Spotify, oh. sorry. I had a, a senior the moment there for a second. Four months old, they've already laid off employees. A couple others have left. Uh, and people are saying, well, I mean, how much longer can airtime go? It's nobody's really using it, right? Airtime actually won't release numbers. They say you uh, need six to 12 months to get a product up and running. That's actually uh, directly what Sean Parker told the New York Times. He says, you can't call this a flop. That's, that's ridiculous. We have a dedicated user base. We're working on an app uh, to, to bring it to mobile. We're working on uh, multiple uh, chat capabilities. So... If I connect with somebody, I could then maybe connect with four people and we could have more of a conversation. So they're working on making a more robust product. But App Data, which is a service that collects data about sites and services that connect with Facebook, that's how they get their data and Airtime forces you to do that, says Airtime has about 400 users a day, 10,000 users over the course of the month. Uh, executives from Airtime say those numbers are off. But Nielsen and Comscore, which are independent analytics firms, say traffic to airtime is small enough to not even register on their chart. So I think it's safe to say that airtime is not a hit. And I wonder, in this day and age, can you really can you really use the excuse of we haven't had enough time to figure out what we're doing yet? We're four months old. We need at least six months to even get up and running and probably at least up to 12. Don't call it a flop yet. We haven't been here for years. That's exactly. one way to put that. Yes. It's going LL cool, Tom. Very eloquent. I, I, LL eloquent. <laughs> I think uh, I, I, I think that's fair. I think four months, I mean, come on. Uh, you know, some some things do take a while to really find their feet and see where they're going, and and people pivot all the time. Uh, Twitter was not what it is now at the beginning. It certainly took more than four months to catch on. So, I mean, would we call Twitter a flop four months in? We would have been wrong if we had. No, this thing is absolutely going to be dead. It's because video chat is not something that's taken off. It's been like this promise for like what 50, 60 years, right? We're gonna have video phones. People are gonna want to sit in front of a camera, and they're gonna be dedicated to what they're doing. Nobody does that anymore. It's very hard to just sit and go, I'm going to watch TV. You got a phone. You got a laptop. You got something else going on. You have a different browser window open. Airtime is dedicated to just doing video chats. And theoretically, well, it's also, you can meet strangers, right? It's also about if you and I connect, we can watch a, thir a third video together type of a thing. So it's more of a we're as if we are sitting together sharing things. iChat had that theater aspect and YouTube, not YouTube, uh, Google's got it with, with YouTube Hangouts and things like that. These are, I think I think in uh, the New York Times piece that they said something like, video chat's a feature. It's not like the only thing you have to, like you can do because the problem with this is, this is all airtime does. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, let's hang out and get together and sit in front of a computer, in front of a camera. Like, it's just, it's just I, it's, I just think it's a very difficult sell because it hasn't sold for like 60 years. Sit in front of a camera and talk to your friends. 60 years? I'm thinking about, like, the video phones, right? Video phones are the future. You don't remember, like, the, the World's Fair stuff? Yeah, but I don't think that was, like, widely available. I'm not sure that's fair. Well, yeah, people were excited and nobody ever used it. Nobody ever got it. That was the problem. Oh. I, 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 my instinct is to agree with you about the fact that <laughs> the instinct is to not. And I'm going to no, no, fight my, it. My instinct is like you're is. right. Nobody wants this. Nobody's made it work. But at the same time, I felt a little bit about that, like I did about tablets, uh, until okay. until Apple came in and said well, we figured out tablets, and now tablets are everywhere. I'm not saying airtime is the iPad 
a video chat, but I'm not. I also I, I would hesitate to say that video chat will never catch on. Maybe because I think we do want to talk to people long distance over video. People just haven't cracked it. Yet. I think Hangouts are the closest thing because that's a yeah. part of Google and Gmail. You're already doing that so social thing. If you're gonna have video chat on uh, on Facebook, that's really good too because it's a part of a larger social thing. But to go to airtime to do this, I think that's the real issue. So. If Airtime gets gobbled up by a bigger company that can incorporate what Airtime does mm -hmm. well into a larger product, that might make more sense. And maybe that's what the Airtime folks are, are, are hoping for. What bothers me about this is that this service gets more attention but also more scrutiny because there are some sort of celebrity tech people behind it. You know, they had a big flashy party. You might have heard about it in New York with celebrities to talk about airtime. It was like this big thing that happened. And because of that, people go, okay, well, this better be awesome. And then you look at the product and say, I don't know, it's a startup. I mean, it's, it's okay. It's an interesting idea. May work, maybe not. But... They get a lot of money because they've got uh, sort of a proven entrepreneurs that are backing it and some interesting names. And here we are talking about it saying, four months later, it's not a hit. What are you going to do? <laughs> so it's sort of a blessing and a curse. Yeah, yeah, that's true. How many Sean's do you have? on your product? Okay, we'll give you a couple more months. Uh, let's talk finally about Google's earnings yesterday. Uh, just just to, to sum up for those of you who, who don't quite understand what happened, R.R. Donnelly is a financial printer. They, they file the SEC reports for companies. Uh, and Google said yesterday, R.R. Donnelly informed us that they had filed our draft 8K earnings statement without authorization. So somebody pressed a button or something that shouldn't have. Google immediately called a T1 halt on the stock. Uh, that means the trading is halted pending the release of material news. They basically said, uh-oh, everybody thinks they know what our earnings statement is. We haven't had a chance to explain. Halt the stock trading until we get a chance to put that news out there. R. R. Donnelly has said they are fully engaged in an investigation to determine how this event took place and are pursuing our first obligation, which is to serve our valued customers, a.k.a. please don't fire us. Uh, so... What actually came out after the leak? Cost per click declined 15%. Uh, that's less money because of mobile. There's, there's less money that they charge for mobile right now. That may change eventually, but because people are moving to mobile more and more often, same problem Facebook has. How do we make money on mobile? Google knows how to make money on mobile. They just can't charge as much for it right now. Uh, Google's mobile business, however, is generating $8 billion annually, and that's up from $2.5 billion last year. Uh, they lost $151 million from Motorola. Not a lot, but it certainly doesn't help. And the analysts, once they actually got a chance to look at the full earnings report, talk to Larry Page on the call, essentially said, you know what? Yeah, this is not a good earnings report for Google, but we're still confident that they're pivoting with the marketplace. It's a bad economy. It's a change in conditions on the ground as people more and more are turning to mobile for usage. Uh, so this is not as disastrous as it may have felt yesterday morning. And Larry Page talked up multi-screen in the earnings call. He said uh, he is moving seamlessly in day-to-day -day computing from his Nexus smartphone to his Nexus tablet and now his brand new Chromebook. And I think this is one key that, that Google is doing well that a lot of people may not pay attention to is you can use the Chrome browser and live in the Google universe and have all your data with you all the time in a way that I don't think you've been able to do up until recently. Yeah, I mean, effectively, that's not easily. That's like networked computing, right? You're supposed to be able to log into your account and be able to have the same settings. This is something we've been promised for lots of years. And Chrome OS is supposed to change all that because they said any computer is your computer. When you go to Chrome OS and you, or a Chromebook, you just sign in and you have the same experience everywhere. I was just having an argument with a friend of mine who was like, why don't you just want one device that has everything you have right there? I'm like, every machine is like my device because I sign into the same services all the time. So like if Evernote's on my MacBook or it's on my Chromebook, it makes no difference. It's all the same. So this multi-screen approach, uh, it, it turns out, at least I don't feel like one device is enough because they seem like the form factors, they dictate the way you use it. And sometimes you want a phone. Sometimes you want a tablet. Sometimes you want to type a lot. So you use a laptop. So Google's multi-screen approach, if they could figure out how to marry Android and Chrome OS properly, it seems like they're still kind of disparate. If they could figure that out, I think they've got a really great long-term approach. Yeah, and I, I think that is one of the ways that they uh, are, are inspiring some confidence in the marketplace. Also, uh, mobile suffering from low cost per click is the same as the web suffering from low advertising back in the, the early part of the 2000s. The way video right now suffers from lower uh, CPMs because 
the market just hasn't moved there yet. Uh, banner ads now are making people lots and lots of money, and they, they had the same knock on them. So it's it's all about the advertising marketplace moving there. Eventually, Google will be able to charge quite a bit of money for cost per click uh, once mobile becomes a mature market. So I, I, I'm not too worried about them there. The the, the, the one screen thing, I think, is, is really something that I have uh, kind of hit me when he was talking about it. I'm like, that's a really good thing for him to to publicize and, and, and hammer on because I'm using it all the time. It's one of the reasons I'm able to do my job the way I'm able to do it. I pick up my tablet. It's an iPad in the morning, uh, but I use Chrome on it to, to save tabs. And then I go in and I sit down at my desktop, which is a Windows machine, and I open all those tabs from the iPad in Windows. And then I start making my Google Doc lineup. You can do that in Safari. Yeah, I mean, you no, don't need Chrome for that. Absolutely. Uh, you, but then you have to use Safari everywhere. Yeah. You can use Chrome in more places than you can use Safari. Yeah, and that, that's true. That's the key, right? You can use Chrome on, well, at least Ice Cream Sandwich, maybe not on every Android phone, but Ice Cream Sandwich and up. And then you can use Chrome on iOS. You can use Chrome on Linux. You, you know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. That's, that's the insidiousness of it. Beware. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. This is, I, this is just a weird story. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia is now campaigning against the Apple logo because they say it suggests original sin because it has a bite out of it. Now, without getting into the religious aspects of it, I'd never thought of that before. Has that, has that occurred to either of you never. before? Never. In fact, I'm flabbergasted that no one has has made that connection, even if it wasn't offensive to them. And just all, like, oh, look at There's all him. kinds of urban legends about how they came up with the apple and how it relates to Newton or Steve Jobs worked in an orchard, et cetera, et cetera. But I never thought, of, I mean, the bite out of it just seemed like, well, yeah, that's what you do. You I have it was apples. I funny and kind take, of thing, you know, B-Y-T-E, you know, computer company, bite, right. bite, bite the apple kind of. Yeah. That's right? all I thought it was. And no. it's, it's an asymmetrical logo. That's the concept. That's as simple as it is. Because and was the forbidden fruit actually an apple? Uh, according, no. From what I, I went to twelve years of Catholic school, by the way. So the, no. The answer, no. <laughs> what was it? It's just it's called a fruit, and everyone assumes it's an apple, but it's not. A, it's it's never actually stated in, in the King James version, anyway. All right. So I so don't. There you go. All right. I don't have to feel bad about this nope. anymore. Good. Well, King James might have changed things. Well, this is the Russian Orthodox bit. Church, so I don't know exactly their their. Uh, of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, they probably don't use the King James. We got some differences. Just guessing. Yeah. With, with James. <laughs> Let's check the calendar. Uh, y Combinator startup school is taking place at Stanford University tomorrow, October twentieth. Samsung Galaxy S3 is coming to Metro PCS October 22nd. That's Monday for $499. Yahoo is announcing their latest earnings report on Monday as well. And Facebook is holding an event at FAO Schwartz, which is a big toy store in New York City, about gifting, their new gifting uh, service where I can send you an actual physical gift. We don't know any more than that, but that's happening on November 1st. The Nintendo Entertainment System was unveiled at uh, FAO Schwartz back in the day. Oh, the Entertainment yeah. System right. is coming. At the New York FAO Schwartz, as a matter of fact. Well, FAO Schwartz is like a huge, yeah. Although famous the one in San Francisco went out of business, so yeah. I, I didn't, yeah, they were I didn't know that they were still... I didn't know... That's because I'm not Tom I Hanks didn't that. dance on the piano. There you go. So if you're going to save your business, just have get, Tom Hanks yeah. dance on a piano. And there. make him turn into Everybody a child. Listening that. rim. Or wait, he goes into a, he turns, I don't know. Have that was a rim. tough let's, movie to follow. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. <laughs> All right, the whole users thing we were talking about yesterday, that was Jack Dorsey's uh, post saying, hey, let's not call them users. That's kind of impersonal. Let's let's think of better terms for that. We talked about it yesterday, and we got a voicemail responding to our discussion. Hey, TNT crew, this is Rob from... Waterford, Michigan. Uh, you talked yesterday about the choice to call customers users and users customers and vice versa. And your guest was very passionate about what a waste of energy it is. I got to say, I worked for Disney for many a summer in their retail outlet at the malls. And it is really strange how much having to refer to the person on the other side of the counter as a guest affects the employees. You just treat people differently when, when you go to your manager and say, I'm having a problem with this customer over in the children's clothing. It comes through differently. Say the guest over at children's clothing is not happy. It's a very strange kind of way to approach things, and it doesn't work for everyone that works for Disney. But for a lot of my fellow employees, it really did have an impact of how I interacted with the customers. Thanks. Love the show. Well, this is the idea behind 
changing names for anything that has a negative connotation. It's not always a conscious yeah. shift, but it sort of happens. It gets you away from the baggage associated with, with a name, right? Yeah, that's a good thing they stopped calling them jerks. <laughs> <laughs> this jerk over here at the makeup counter but needs some assistance. They were soda jerks for a long time. Yeah, right. They, what are they called now? They're yeah. like... Uh, they are called uh, out of work because there are no more soda fountain counters. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get an email about the one that exists. <laughs> I actually am in southern Illinois where there, there is a soda fountain. You do see this, there. though. There are certain company cultures. I mean, sometimes you'll even see a sign posted like, uh, the bathrooms are only available to our guests. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there'll, there'll be some verbiage where you go, oh, okay, they have a certain way that they yeah. describe the people that are here. And that's just, you know, in a restaurant or something physical. But, yeah, I mean, apparently sometimes it helps. The problem is it works temporarily. Eventually... If you use guest instead of customer, all the negative associations that attach to the word customer migrate to the word guest. And then you have to come up with a new name. Uh, and, and you see this when people try to change names for like, the, uh, the, I'm trying to think of like handicap. Uh, uh, the politically correct terms. And then right, say right. differently abled. And you're always trying to get ahead of whatever the, whatever the negative association is. But that negative association to a customer, if it exists in retail, is just going to glom onto the new one. So it's a it's a never ending war. It's a good thing we're just called twits. Yeah, here. We just undercut it right from just the beginning. Just take the insult and own it. Well, that, my friends, is it for this episode of Tech News. That's all you today. get. Go uh, home. That's all you get. Go home. Oh, okay. Just, okay. All right. I'm just backing you up Bye. here. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't forget about our subreddit, though, technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, I shouldn't point, I'm told, because that's accusatory. We should use a thumb. You go to the subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. We want your vote on what stories we should cover each and every day. We use that to uh, figure out our lineup. Uh, also, if you liked a particular moment at any point in any episode of Tech News Today, let us know about it. It helps us make our best of show at the end of the year. Just email TNT at twit.tv and put the subject best of in the subject line so that we know that's what it is about. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us at TNT at twit.tv and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We're going to take a couple of days off. Here in the United States, we call it the weekend, but we'll be back on Monday with Callie Lewis. See you there.